Today, we're going to talk about Eric Erickson, who is a very important figure in personality development because he took this sense of stages that we've been talking about and really developed the idea that there are stages in adult life much further. Now, you may have been asking yourself, as you have been uh, you know, going through these theories, you know, how does this kind of apply to me now? I mean, if, if you're thinking about your life right now, and you're, you're asking yourself, um, or you're thinking about, I am, I'm going to start a new career. I mean, is this really going to affect my personality? Will I change somewhat because of this career? Or perhaps you're in an important relationship, and you're, you're thinking of getting married, uh, and you're wondering, you know, I mean, will this change my life? Uh, perhaps you're involved with someone of the same sex and you're thinking of taking a relationship and making it more permanent and doing something to demonstrate that. And you're asking yourself, I mean, will, will my personality be affected by this? Uh, perhaps you are thinking about having a child and, uh, and you're wondering, you know, will my life change uh, when I have a child? And this would have to be your first child, because anybody who has had a child knows that if you have a child, your life changes rather dramatically. Or uh, it, it's possible that uh, you've been in a relationship, and uh, it's not working. As far as you're concerned, it's not working. Uh, and you're, ten, you know, you're thinking about ending it. But this may be producing a certain amount of anxiety, because you're going to leave someone that you've spent a lot of time with. Uh, you may be frightened about being single again. Uh, you may uh, feel, I really don't want to get into the so-called dating scene again. Uh, so there, a lot of things can be going on uh, you know, in your life that do not seem to be accounted for by the theories we've had. And if you notice, what happens in, in most of our theories, the heavy emphasis is on the first few years of life. And more recently, the theories have actually gotten you to the point where they declare you're in adulthood by kind of naming the last stage the genital stage. And there are these kind of, you know, wonderful generalizations in which the theorist seems to be saying, if you have managed to get through all the stages we've talked about up to now, and you are actually involved with another human being, and you are successfully having sex, that somehow the rest will be fine. That you've, you've kind of made it, you haven't been overwhelmed by, by mom in the early stages or dad and you haven't been overwhelmed by potty training and you haven't been overwhelmed by discovering you have sexual organs and you haven't been overwhelmed uh, by developing a close friendship with kids. So everything is gonna be fine. Well, that really is not very helpful to you uh, in your adult life when you realize there is a lot going on inside me. And, uh, and our theorists often haven't developed uh, our theory to talk about what happens in our adult lives. Uh, in fact, these theorists remind me, I, I was thinking about this. When I was in college, we had this guy who was really brilliant in math. And you know, while all the rest of us were struggling to figure out uh, this theorem and, and, and what was this all about and how did it get derived and why did you go from this point to this point, when exams came, what this guy would do is he would look at the question and then he would, and, and you always had to start like developing a theorem. So he would develop the first line of the theorem and then he would show you what the second line was and he would do the third line and then he would write, the rest is obvious. And this used to really bug professors because they all knew the guy knew it. And he just wasn't about to write down what he thought were very simplistic equations. Uh, by the way, that the rest of us thought weren't so simplistic. But to him, it was really clear. And so he only gave this outline, and he said the rest is obvious. Well, it seems to me some of our personality theorists uh, are kind of guilty of the same thing. That is, they're saying to us, if you get to a certain stage, well, then the rest will work out. You, you're now an adult, and you can figure out the rest of what's going to happen. Uh, that really isn't true, of course. Uh, there are many, many complex things that happen in life. And, and as you'll see with Erickson today, I mean, not only 
uh, you know, do we have to look at what happens, uh, let's say, to our cells, what's happening to yourself right now, since most of you are, are younger. Uh, but if you look at your parents, you'll realize that your parents may be in a different stage. They may be coming to a point uh, where they're thinking about retiring. Perhaps they have retired. Uh, question comes, you know, does life change when you retire? Uh, is there something that goes on in life? Do you continue to grow and develop like after you retire? Or do you retire and you just wait to die? Uh, which some people actually think is what happens. Uh, you'll find in our theory today that there is a lot that goes on that was unattended to until Eric Erickson came along and started to take a look at life right from birth to death. And, and this is the first theory that has that kind of comprehensiveness to it where there's some detail. Now, Erickson is a man who was born in 1902 near Frankfurt, Germany. And you notice a lot of our, our psychoanalytic theorists were born in Germany. And in his case, his father actually abandoned the family before he was born. And, and, there are some, and, and it, this is you know, not really clear in his history. So there are, are some people who have studied his history who believe he was illegitimate. And, and that's just not clear. However, we do know that his mother eventually married a man, Dr. Theodore Hamburger. And what is important in the life of Erickson was, since his father abandoned him before he was born, father abandoned the family, Erickson grew up thinking that Eric Hamburger was, or excuse me, Theodore Hamburger was his father. And he wasn't told until later in his life that actually uh, this was not his father. Now, when he did find this out, and this he was still in his childhood, he actually changed his name from Hamburger to Erickson. And you'll see uh, when his name is written out in places, he will either be Eric H. Erickson or Eric Hamburger Erickson. And there, there's not a lot of information about why he did this, like why he changed. But some people speculate that it, it was very obvious that although, uh, you know, he was born into a Jewish family and his parents were clearly German, that he was quite recognizable as being Scandinavian and that he really changed his name to allow himself to have the identity that he thought people attributed to him, uh, namely that, that he really was Scandinavian. And you, you want to keep some of these facts in mind because you'll see that identity uh, for Erickson is very important. And, and you'll find that as you follow his theory, it becomes clear that you know, perhaps some of his insights were, were due to his own personal experience. Now, as I've said it with a number uh, of our people, especially who was talking about Solomon yesterday, Erickson was not a good student, and he did not like school. Uh, what he did is he eventually came to enjoy art. And, and as a young man, he pursued a, a career in the field of art. And what this meant for him, pretty much, was kind of traveling throughout Europe, uh, doing a lot of sketching, and, and trying to establish a career in this field. And then eventually, he became an art teacher in a, in a small experimental nursery in Vienna. And here he was reunited with, with a high school friend of his, Peter Blah. Blah is B-L-O-S. And Peter Blah introduced Eric Erickson to Anna Freud who was Sigmund Freud's daughter. And this really is a defining moment uh, for Eric Erickson. This changes his life. He eventually becomes a, a child psychoanalyst. Uh, Anna Freud, of course, was famous for being a child psychoanalyst. And he was introduced to the psychoanalytic community. Uh, he actually got to know Freud. And he became so intrigued with this, he began exploring how to become a psychoanalyst, and he eventually became a psychoanalyst. 
Then, after marrying a Canadian-American woman by the name of Joan Serson, S-E-R-S-O-N, he eventually came to the United States. And he worked as the very first child psychoanalyst in Massachusetts. And he held positions at Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, and the Harvard Psychological Clinic. Pretty heady stuff when you consider this is someone who never finished college. And Eric Erickson has no college degrees. Uh, he has a lot of honorary doctorates because Eric Erickson eventually became a very famous professor at Harvard. But all of this was because of the theory that we're going to talk about today, not because he went through the usual process that we're going through of getting an undergraduate degree, getting graduate degrees, and all of that. Uh, this man does it on the basis of his sheer brilliance. Now, during this period when he was a child analyst and, and working in Massachusetts, he was heavily influenced uh, during this period by anthropologists and especially by Margaret Mead, uh, Gregory Bateson, and Ruth Benedict. Of course, and those were the, the leading anthropologists of the day. Eventually, yeah, he served on the faculties of several psychoanalytic institutes. And not only was he on the faculty uh, at Harvard, but he was on the faculty at Yale uh, and at Berkeley. And while he was at Berkeley was the time that the Joe McCarthy was running the scare on all of these communists who were in the universities. And these communists were causing all kinds of problems for the students. So Berkeley came up with this great idea that they would have all of their professors sign a loyalty oath, which said that they were not communists and they would not teach such things. And this led to you know, tremendous upheaval that, uh, that you would have to sign this loyalty oath uh, because obviously the assumption was if you didn't do it that somehow you weren't a loyal person. And people experienced that as a real restriction on themselves. Now, Eric Erickson wrote a very eloquent statement about why, as an American, one should not sign a loyalty oath and he left Berkeley rather than do it. And for those of you who have studied uh, the history uh, of this movement, or in some cases the history of psychology, uh, you'll find it, it's interesting, many people claim that it was their discipline that, uh, or some figure that actually started this movement at Berkeley uh, to refuse to sign the loyalty oath and to leave the university. Uh, for people who really have, you know, accurately documented things, there is really no question but that the chairman in psychology at Berkeley is the person who led the faculty of Berkeley uh, in leaving the university and refusing to go along with signing the loyalty oath and giving in to McCarthyism. Now, perhaps the outstanding contribution uh, from Eric Erickson was that as a follower of Freud, he accepted a lot of Freud's insights, but he expanded psychoanalytic theory greatly from one that was oriented to psychopathology. And you'll recall how often I pointed out to you that theories are being developed from working with patients. So they're being developed from observing psychopathology. And he went from that to create a developmental theory and his developmental theory was healthy and growthful. So he was talking about more average people rather than trying to derive a theory uh, at, from what went wrong. He was deriving a theory about what should go right. And if things go right, how will you develop? It's a very exciting theory. Uh, also, uh, importantly for him, he focused on the ego. You notice often we have been talking about the id, about kind of the unacceptable impulses that one has. Here's someone who talks about the ego, and, and he also gives the ego it, its own energy. So he says that, you know, there is a positive force in people, 
and this positive force can, can help you to develop. And he actually, uh, you know, is one of the leaders in a field that became known as ego psychology. And ego psychology is a later branch of psychoanalytic thought. And he emphasized the integration of psychosocial forces with biology and said that that's how personality uh, is really determined. So he allowed that biology plays a role, but he was saying it's psychosocial forces that really make the difference. And because he allowed the ego to have its own energy, he was saying that you know, things can develop that are not necessarily conflictual. That is, all the energy in you is not always going to dealing with conflict. Much of the energy, that is the energy of the ego, is going into a creative process where you develop as a person and where you're not necessarily warring with some kind of impulse. Now, Erickson believed that personality was governed by what he called, or others have called, the epigenetic principle. And the epigenetic principle says that personality develops in a series of stages unfold in a predetermined sequence. And what he believed was that the ego was the fundamental mechanism during which such development occurred. And, and very importantly, and this is what I was saying at the beginning, he believed that the ego developed throughout life. Now, if we can go to our first uh, slide. Don't get concerned that you see so much in this slide. I'm going to break it down into eight parts. It's going to repeat. Uh, so, but just as to kind of to show you, he actually had a birth to death theory that had eight stages. And he felt that one could identify an approximate age whereby a person experienced each developmental stage. Uh, you'll notice in, in our past theorists, when you look at the estimated age here, we rarely got to beyond 12 in, in most of the theories, and, and certainly not much beyond 20. You'll notice he has stages that run in the 20s, run in the beyond the 20s, uh, don't start till age 65. Uh, so this really is the, the first theory that tries to look at development across the life cycle. And it's important, you know, that, that he believed that the ego, and remember the ego now is going to be the center of this theory. He believed that the ego experienced a specific crisis at each stage and that that crisis determined the kind of coping mechanisms that one developed to deal with the issues of that stage. So the ego is going to see a crisis in whatever stage you're in and it's going to be the ego that tries to resolve it. Now, unlike Freud, he felt that crises were resolved satisfactorily depending to a considerable degree on the quality of a person's psychosocial experiences. So he's like some of our more recent theorists, uh, like Fromm, for instance, and Sullivan, who are really emphasizing that, you know, the growth in your life depends on the quality of the relationships that you have and how effective you are in being involved with other people. And Erickson also believed that the individual really was paramount in resolving stages. And he indicated it was the attempts of a person to cope with and be creative during a stage that actually determined a healthy resolution. So he's saying, you know, it is the ego in you, and often he's equating the ego with that part of yourself that's creative, and it's the energies that you pour into trying to resolve whatever is the major conflict of the stage you're in, or the major challenge, actually, of the stage you're in that causes you to move on. Because he didn't see all of this as conflict. Now, Erickson also posited that a specific ego strength, and, and you'll find, by the way, in, in some of the texts, that the word ego strength appears 
And then sometimes the word virtue is used. And uh, for all intents and purposes, you can think of these as synonymous. And it is the ego strength or virtue uh, that is developed in a stage that enables a person to better cope. And, and his theory was that, that as you developed a, a virtue in each of these stages, not only did that virtue help you to overcome uh, and, and work with whatever the challenge was at that stage, but then that virtue was available to you to help you in further stages so that as you got older and older, you would have more and more virtues, you would have more and more abilities to cope with whatever was presented to you. So in, in, in kind of simplistic terms, what I'm really saying here is that each stage required its own ego strength or virtue for resolution. And, and by the way, in this chart that you've seen up here, uh, you'll see one that's even more elaborated if you look uh, in your textbook, where Dr. Allen on page 163 has, uh, adds a little more data than you'll see in what I have put forward. Now, Eric post, uh, Erickson postulated then that there were eight stages, and the eight stages are going to span one's entire life. The first four stages are, are really, in many ways, quite similar to the stages that, that Freud uh, told us about, except that uh, the difference with Erickson, he's, he's going to put much more emphasis on social interaction. And, and he also de-emphasized the sexual conflicts that Freud had posited were actually the driving forces in these first stages. So we now go to stage one, called the oral sensory stage. And essentially, you know, Erickson saw the beginning of life as determined by the quality of social interaction between the mother and infant. And of course, you know, mother-infant is the prototype in all of our theories for the beginning of life. But Erickson had some, some interesting shifts. He believed, for example, that the child learned to feel safe if he or she could rely upon the mother. Now, I remember we're talking again about our, our little child here, you know, newborn, first year of life, child's just experiencing the world. The question becomes for the child, is this world that I'm discovering a safe place? And Erickson is saying it becomes very important that the child experience this world as a safe place. And of course, the presence of the mother then became most important. And what Erickson posited was the mother really has to be active and she has to be a giving person so that the child can experience a basic security that, that he knows or she knows that mom will take care of me. And so he said what happens with the child is the child develops a basic trust that life is okay. Now, in his model, then, if the mother acted ambivalently, or let's say the mother was inconsistent, then a child might develop basic mistrust, which meant the child began life experiencing the external world as either dangerous, uh, it's not like being in the womb, uh, where life was much more predictable, uh, and the result can be since mom is inconsistent, or at times not there, that the child begins to experience anxiety. And, and so this becomes the first roots of anxiety for him were that mom is not dependable. And of course, uh, like in all theories I've mentioned, you know, mom or, or whoever is playing that role. Now, like our other theorists, you know, Erickson did believe that a lot of learning takes place in this very first stage of life. For example, he believed that the healthy child should not be completely trusting, since the real world is not to be completely trusted. So he didn't feel like the child should be in bliss, you know, with no worries about anything, because the real world is not that way. So he felt 
you know, having a few problems and, and, and having to, to cope was a good learning experience during this time. However, he did believe that the major outcome of this stage needs to be that the, the child is far more trusting of the environment than the child is mistrusting. So having this basic trust is, is very key. And he felt if this occurs, the child develops a, a sense of confidence and hope. And it is the virtue of hope that becomes the ego strength that guides the child through the latter part of this stage. And if the child develops hope, then he or she is prepared to move on into the next stage. Erickson, interestingly, also saw uh, that the virtue of hope actually prepares a person for faith, which you know, is obviously necessary for religious belief. And unlike Freud, Erickson actually thought that religious beliefs were healthy and that they fostered a sense of trust in the goodness of humankind. So, uh, and, and here, uh, you know, is a person who, while he's working through uh, this theory, he is, he is also, you know, looking at the bigger picture and even pointing out that the roots uh, of whether a child will really be able to uh, move towards religion probably start very early in life. And, uh, and he posited that in his hierarchy that hope was necessary before one would really develop faith. Now then, we move on to the second stage, called the muscular anal stage. And this is the stage that closely resembles uh, Freud's second stage. And of course, both Freud and Erickson posited that toilet training is the major psychological and social experience during the second and third years of life. Now, because of his anthropological training, Erickson pointed out that this stage is not necessarily universal uh, and it does not create conflict in all cultures. Now, up until now, you know, our people have been generalizing from what they observed in European and American cultures that this stage develops fairly rigidly. Uh, Erickson came along and says, no, no, we're, it doesn't have to be that way but it is that way in our culture. Uh, he indicated, for example, that the potty training is a scene for intense conflict in our culture, but it's because of our need for cleanliness, our need for punctuality, and our need for control. And it is during this phase that children are trained to obey. And this experience, just being trained to obey, is always a conflictual experience for children. Children do not naturally want to obey. So when you're teaching your child to obey, and all of you who have done this know this, children don't just spontaneously say, great, really wanted to obey. <laughs> uh, so in this stage, there will be conflict. And this also is the time then when the ego begins to strive for independence. And so what happens is the child begins to test what behaviors are acceptable. And so this is the time when the child begins to learn something about limits. You know that I can do this and the parents think it's okay. I do that, they start getting upset. I do that too much, they get real upset. So the limits are tested, uh, but by testing the limits, of course, conflicts occur. And the parent's role, he thought, is key at this time in helping the child develop a sense of autonomy by feeling in control on the one hand and being able to experiment on the other. So here's where he saw you know, the parents and their ability to guide the child can open up vistas for the child. Now, the ideal outcome in this stage is that the child becomes acculturated, but at the same time, the child feels a sense of control, that the child feels that he or she can lead their own life. 
And so the ego strength or the virtue that we associate with this period is called will, which Erickson indicated was the experience to appreciate that one had free choice, but at the same time, one needed to exercise self-control or self-restraint. Uh, so in this stage, a lot of learning is occurring, as I mentioned. Now, if parents are not good guides during this important stage, children may experience shame and doubt, which leads them to believe that they are not effective, and importantly, that they do not have control of their environment. And the result is, and, and this is common, the children then become less experimental, and they develop rigid personality patterns, uh, sometimes referred to as obsessive compulsive personalities, which you will recall we have always related to the anal stage. And of course, uh, this Freud made this observation very clearly, and most of the psychoanalytic theorists also made this observation that it is in the anal stage that the roots of obsessive compulsive neurosis start because this is where one uh, learns in a negative way to be overly rigid, to be overly limited, that taking risks can be scary, it generates too much anxiety, and, uh, and so children fail to experiment more. And of course, if you don't resolve this stage well, then you're gonna have much more difficulty in future stages. Now, in Erickson's system, then in the next stage, we went on to what is called, we go on to what is called, the locomotor genital stage. This occurs between the, the ages of four and five. And it has a lot of similarities, actually, uh, you know, to, to Freud's phallic stage. Uh, this is a highly interpersonal period where children become curious both about their friends and they become curious uh, about their surroundings. And during this time, children tend to ask incessant questions about innumerable things. And, uh, and the observation that Erickson made is that this is a time when children really have a lot of fantasies. I mean, they are really curious and they are examining things, but they're also imagining a lot of things. And Erickson also believed that children are unduly interested in sex during this stage. And so it was very like Freud who took that same position. Only in, in Erickson, he saw this as healthy since the child was experiencing considerable stimulation from his or her genitals. And so it was not at all surprising that they would be a major focus of interest for a child uh, during this stage. Now, Erickson also made a, a clearer observation than others about the fact that during this period, it is not uncommon that children become more interested in the parent of the opposite sex. And he believed that this should be encouraged and that if a child was allowed to indulge with being close to the opposite sex parents, it would allow for healthy growth. And what he added to the theory was he talked about the so-called neglected parent, which of course would be the parent of the same sex as the child. And if the neglected parent felt that he or she is not doing enough, that they should be more involved with the child, or they became jealous of the, uh, the child being so involved with the other parent, then the parent might feel they were being punished. And, uh, and, and what happens then, if they kind of demand that the child be more involved with them, the child begins to feel that he or she is being punished. And so what he did is he encouraged parents to allow children the freedom to experiment and to learn from whatever initiatives they were undertaking and to see uh, you know, these patterns uh, that I've been describing as really being healthy and good. Now, it was Erickson's thesis 
that if a child resolved this stage, he or she believed that they had moved to a higher level of functioning. That is, they were now members of a bigger world. And the interesting thing that children deducted, he thought, was that as they saw themselves as being members of a bigger world, they felt they had purpose. And purpose is the virtue of this stage. And he thought that actually children begin to formulate a sense of life goals as a result of resolving this stage. He felt it is, if you healthily move through this stage, you really do begin to look outside yourself. You really do begin to look at what is this world about and what is my purpose in it. Now, I, I've mentioned this a, a number of times, but I need to mention again that, you know, Erickson, to some extent, really was a product of his times. And we saw this with uh, many of our theorists. So he tended to stereotype the activities that males and females engage in. And so females often appear more passive and less engaged in activities that might lead to things like power and creativity than men are. And he actually has been criticized by feminists and has responded that he did not intend to set limits on women. And, and I think he really meant that. Uh, I think the criticism that he got later in his life helped him to see uh, the bias in the way he presented some things that the kind of typical feminine characteristics were keeping these young women from being more focused on power uh, and creativity. And so he changed and, and made it very clear that it was not his intention to make that distinction. Now, it, overall, by the way, his theory has been much more acceptable to, to feminists uh, than other psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theories. But uh, they still, you know, uh, have doubts that he appreciated the need to characterize women at this stage as having the identical potential that men have. And, uh, but if someone were teaching this stage today, one would go to real lengths to, to posit that uh, women will develop the same sense of purpose, women will discover the world in, in the way that men do, and that, that this stage is really the critical time for kind of seeing where am I going in life. Now this is followed by the latency stage. And this kind of loosely follows uh, Freud, but, but it deviates a fair amount because in, in Erickson, the latency stage actually takes place between about ages 6 and 12. And during this time, Erickson's focus for children was on the learning of new skills. And he, develop, he, he felt that children develop a sense of industry whereby they, they move into an even larger world in which they feel they have control. So it's not a scary world because they feel they have control. It's an exciting world. And he noted <clears throat> that teachers are particularly important during this time and that the, the loving and caring teacher who rewards children does much to advance this sense of industry uh, in children. Now, since he always posited, you know, the possibility of failure, he said, if a child fails to develop this sense of industry, then they will develop feelings of inferiority. And, and he felt if the inferiority is actually, you know, intense enough, it really may lead the child into a period of regression where the child seeks parental protection rather than moving towards greater autonomy and more involvement with other kids. So it's a very important period. And the failure to resolve the period can not only uh, fixate the child at that stage, it may even cause the child to regress and, and, and to run away from uh, the development that needs to take place. So the virtue then that developed during this time he called competence, meaning that a child began to experiment with a number of new behaviors 
And the child believes that, that he or she can excel and take risks without experiencing undue anxiety. He doesn't suggest that the child's experimenting is going to be without anxiety, but he is saying that the anxiety is at a level the child can handle. And, and that becomes the important thing for the child to be able to, to move forward. Now we're going to start moving into stages that uh, we don't hear as much about from other theorists. Other theorists have posited an adolescent stage, but Erickson talks more specifically about it. And, and actually, when he first began to you know, propose this theory, it was his talking about adolescence that really caught people's attention. Because in the first stages I've just mentioned, uh, you know, at the time, people knew a lot about Freud, and they knew a lot about the neo-Freudians, and they knew a lot about these various stages, and other people had posited stages similar to Freud, and they had described these stages as, you know, having nuances that were different in one way or another. And of course, Fromm uh, and Adler and Horney had all said that in those stages, uh, there's much more activity uh, that's important interpersonally. But people didn't get into adolescence the way that Erickson did, and, and this caught people's attention. And he is quoted more often than any other individual for having appreciated the importance of this stage and how adolescence prepares a person for adulthood. Now, you know, if you think about this, you know, recall your own adolescence. You know, if you do, you can probably remember the risks that you took. And if you think back into your adolescence, uh, you may remember how frightened uh, at times you were when you were going to try out something new. And, and you may recall how important it was for you to be part of a social group and to be accepted by that group. That, that these were powerful experiences as you are going through school. And it really uh, became important for you to develop an identity. And and it's during this time that one begins to feel that I am somebody, that, that, that the me here in this group is important. Now, what makes the stage particularly difficult is that any failures in previous stages create psychological deficiencies that make resolution uh, in this stage more difficult. So, if you haven't developed those virtues that we talked about in the earlier stages, you don't have as much ego going for you, you don't have as much uh, accomplishment going for you as you try to take on what can be some fairly scary things in your adolescence. Also at this time, uh, you know, youngsters begin to experience very strong sexual feelings. And so they begin to wonder, you know, how can I safely express these feelings? And also they wonder, can they be valued in an intimate way by other people? Uh, and if you recall, when you first began uh, to feel sexual and you first thought about being sexually involved with someone else, you know, for most people, that's pretty scary. Uh, and in fact, it's not uncommon that people deny that for a while uh, because the feelings are too intense and one doesn't know what to do with it. So he was saying this is a period where it's very important that as you discover your intimate self that you also find it's acceptable to others. He felt also that not only is an individual developing identity uh, in terms of whether they're, they're sexually desirable, and by the way, you know, if you begin to think you're sexually desirable, then you're confronted with, are you sexually competent? And while all that's going on, he saw the adolescent as also focusing on the world of work. Uh, or, you know, if you're a student, uh, we might think of it more as career development. But it's not just that during this period, one is learning about friends, and one is discovering one's own sexuality, and is there some way to express this, 
but also there's a whole other part of life. And the whole other part of life is that you're in school, uh, that you're wondering about what you're going to do, and, uh, and asking yourself, uh, what will I be? And so in the, the, the complexity of this stage, uh, and in fact, the stage really is so complex that there are very few people who fail to struggle in this stage. If you look back at when these kinds of ideas were coming to you, uh, and if you're able to, to tune in to what you, know, you felt, you probably will recognize there were times when you struggled with all of this. And so the idea of role confusion is something that happens. Only what Erickson said is that, you know, you shouldn't think of role confusion, uh, which in, in our diagram here is, is negative, but you shouldn't think of it as abnormal because probably most people experience role confusion. Most people have questions during this period about themselves and they're trying to figure out, you know, what can I do? So he posited then that anxiety uh, was actually normative during this stage. And what he said was, if the experience is not overwhelming, an adolescent is really able to develop a sense of who he or she is, and, and they begin to form an acceptable identity. That is, they begin to find ways to express who I am uh, in a way that might be a little different than who other people are. But, but I know my identity, I like my identity, but my identity gets formed through being challenged, through having anxieties, and, uh, and oftentimes through worrying, am I doing this thing right or not? Now, there are more complications during this stage. For instance, parents often begin to relive their hopes through their children. Thus, children sometimes appear to resolve the stage easily because they've chosen a career. I'm going to be a lawyer. I am going to be a teacher. I am going to be a plumber. I am going into the family business. And the parents love hearing this. It becomes very important for the parents. Now, in our, our next lecture, we're really going to talk about what is the outcome of these kind of feelings and, and what occurs with children as they try to resolve the stage. So we'll take a break for now.